This is The Low Post. I'm Eric Stark, joined with Mike Gross, sports writer from the Sunday News. And we've got several topics. Let's get right to it. Uh, Philip Eagles held their first mini camp over the weekend, and a uh, surprised guest, <laughs> Lito Shepard, a member of the Eagles for many years now, two time Pro Bowler, showed up at practice, which surprised a lot of people. They thought he'd be out of town by now, be a trade, or at least holding out for this. Uh, so I'm going to ask you, Mike. Uh, should he stay or should he go? Steal from the clash a little bit. Well, here's what here's what's interesting to me about this. And I was down at that, that mini camp on Saturday, and and I'm I'm surprised how much the Eagles, Andy Reid and, and Jim Johnson, are both uh, sort of like gushing about the possibility of keeping Lido and having these three big time corners with Brown and and Asante Samuel. Uh, in fact, uh, Jim Johnson said. It's like having it's like having two big brown like the Kentucky Derby winner. It's like having two of those, and it's a wonderful thing. And 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 um, it seems like they're saying that more than they need to be saying it. I mean, more than is obligatory. I still think that it's more likely that he's going to be traded. They'll get into training camp. Some team will have a a cornerback will blow out his knee, and they'll be able to make some kind of a deal. Uh, but I, I don't think it's impossible. That they could play with all, I think there's a chance they play with all three, and I don't think that's a terrible thing. It will be wrong with keeping it. Wouldn't you have the best secondary, probably in the NFC, if not football, if you had Sunday Samuel, Sheldon Brown, Acilio Hansen is another guy, a young guy that's coming on for them, and have Shepard in the mix? I think Brown plays more in the slot then, could play a little bit of safety. I think he's a better tackler than what you got with Constantine right now. It reminds me a lot of what you had in the early, uh, the late '90s, early 2000s, when you had Troy Vincent, Bobby Taylor, and Al Harris. Yeah, sure. Compar- uh, very comparable situation. A um, couple of things. Number one, the Eagles—they uh, don't care what anybody thinks. They don't care what the conventional wisdom is, and they don't care if Lito Shepard is unhappy. Really, I mean, that's their—that's their mo. That's their track record. So I, I think it's more possible than than, it, than it's being portrayed that, that they'll play all three guys. He's got. He's under contract until 2011, and I think he missed four games last year. Was hurt, and you know his agents allowed to shop him around. I think if he could have got the money from another team, maybe there would have been a deal. I think he needs to just come into camp, shut up, and play football for a year. Which he basically healthy. has done. I mean, yeah. he has not. He's not. He hasn't been since he showed up for this mini camp, which was mandatory, but it carried an eighty five hundred dollar fine. Lito can afford that. Yeah. Um, it, you know, he, he's been a pretty good soldier, and I, I don't think this is as big a deal as maybe some people are making it out to be. The biggest difference back when they had it, and Andy Reid's made the comment, uh, well, we have three starters with Sheldon Brown, Shepard, and, and Samuel. The biggest difference back when you look at Vincent Brown and uh, Vincent Taylor and ha- Al Harris when they were there was Al Harris was never a starter in that group. You have three guys now that were starters. Hopefully they can check their egos. More or less at the same point in their careers. I mean, it is yeah. different. You're right. You're right. Vincent and Taylor were two real established guys, and Harris was the, was the upstart. Speaking of established guys that are having their careers sort of put in the spotlight and having their, their lives put in the spotlight right now, Roger Clemens. Is it newsworthy that he's supposed to have had extracurricular activities with several women? Mike, is it newsworthy or not? Uh, I, I don't think it is. I think it's bad journalism. The New York Daily News has reported that uh, Clemens has had affairs with a 15-year-old girl, a Manhattan bartender, and John Daly's ex-wife. Quite a trio. Quite an impressive trio. Um, this is what athletes do, kids. I mean, let's, let's, let's face it. And the only reason why... Uh, the New York Daily News would arguably say that this is that this is uh, le- legitimate journalism is because it goes to this defamation lawsuit that he, uh, Clemens is actually suing Brian McNamee, the guy who accused him in the Mitchell report of, uh, of uh, use of HGH and other performance enhancing drugs, and and therefore this could come up in the trial. Well, that that seems. That doesn't make sense to me for a couple of reasons. Number one, why is the New York Daily News doing the investigative work that Brian McNamee's lawyers ought to be doing? Yeah. One and and two, if I if I sue somebody because I think they've done something, they've defamed me. Is every behavior that I've ever had in my life therefore relevant to that lawsuit? Under the rules of this lawsuit, yeah, they can go back and. Well, get- they can, but I, I mean, is that is that is, is that a legitimate? Justification for the New York Daily News to be reporting this. 
as McLaughlin would say, wrong. Thank you. Who cares? Thank you. Who cares? Go away, Roger Clemens. You did steroids. Go away, Barry Bonds. Go away, Mark McGuire. You were my heroes. You're no more my heroes. Do it, Starkey. Do it. Very passionate and very well stated. Yeah, and it, believe me, I am not in any way, shape, or form defending Roger Clemens, who I have always thought was a simp, uh, a Grand Canyon-esque ego, uh, just a bad person. And, uh, you know, no sympathy here for Clemens. Just... It doesn't matter what you think of somebody when you're talking about journalistic what's right and what's wrong. You know, I want him to go away, but you know who I'm glad hasn't gone away? The Philadelphia Flyers. What wow. a great season this year. Wonderful to watch these guys play. And this is a worst-to-first situation. They're not in first yet, but they're, they're playing darn well. They had the worst record in hockey last year, Mike, and this year they're making it to the Eastern Finals. And it wasn't automatic that they were going to make the playoffs until the last couple weeks of the season. Now they're in the Final Four of the sport, yeah. The Against stuff. a team from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. It's an all-Pennsylvania uh, Eastern Conference uh, Stanley Cup Final. So it, it, it should be cool just from that respect. Um, a couple of things about this series as we try to break it down, and neither neither Starkey nor I are, are hockey guys, but but we're going to give you what we got. Um, the, the Penguins, to me, just watching Sports Center, are the are the best, the most impressive looking hockey team uh, in the NHL. They they always have these really cool looking goals that yeah. uh, you know they, they, the the tic tac toe passing sure. as they say and. And uh, Sidney Crosby is just a great, great player. Uh, they have multiple lines that do this stuff. It's not just Crosby's lines that, that, that makes all these uh, tremendous offensive plays. They're an impressive offensive team to watch, and I really think they're a clear favorite of the Flyers. I think so, too. But you know what? The Flyers have not been the favorite in any of these series. They weren't favored against the Capitals or the Canadiens, and they, were, they, they clearly were the better team in both of those series. And uh, to steal a line from Chip Smedley, the guy we brought on as our expert before, 6-2 and two right now. Same as the Sporting News, so he's doing pretty good with his predictions. As far as predicting who's going to win each of the series, yeah. He uh, made the comment to me, he didn't know that uh, Marty Baron and Martin Brodeur, the Devils, going, were going to switch bodies because uh, Berd- uh, Baron's been great in goal for the Flyers, and that's the key in the playoffs is to have a hot goaltender. And a lot of, yeah, the, the, the Flyers being where they are is, is, is a good example of the hot goaltender uh, theory, which, which brings me to, in the previous series against Montreal, uh, where, where the Canadians were, were getting their, their goaltender, who was a very, it's a very established star guy, was getting outplayed by the Flyer, Flyers goaltender, and the Canadians coach for Game Four of the series replaced his his starting goaltender with the second string guy. I think that was a disastrous move. I think that was a really crucial. And remember, it, the series was only two games to one at that point. Uh, I think that was a crucial bad move, not only in hockey terms, but in terms of the sort of psychology of playoff series, the message you send to both teams that, hey, we're really desperate. Yeah, it it screwed up with Price's mind. I think it also screwed with his team's mind. And I think it gave the Flyers a bigger edge, too. We we, we, we got this guy. And then they stick him back in net. It's like, you know, they, yeah, they, they yeah. Do what are you going to do? Yeah. That's right. What are you going to do if if this backup goalie gives up eight goals in Game Four? Then you're going to go back to this guy. That yeah. you, I mean, that was almost like a rookie mistake in terms of the mental and emotional side of of, of sports and of, of a playoff series. By I, I think that really, really. But you can't say the Flyers wouldn't have won anyway because they really, they really dominated. This really series. did play well. That's an example of, of a coach maybe out coaching himself a little bit. No here. question. No now, question. We're going to shift gears a little bit. <laughs> and talk about a coach who is not out coaching himself, and also uh, a team that's been playing really well as the Philadelphia Phillies. Two points with this: one, Shane Victorino just came off of an injury, right? And his get- replacement at the time was Jason Worth, who was playing very good baseball at the time, batting two seventy nine, five home runs, ten RBI in the fifteen games in center field, replacing Shane Victorino. Do you take Shane Victorino and put him back in center and put Worth on the bench again and platoon him, uh, or you know what do you do there, Mike? Well, it's a, it, it's a, it's a tough call. It's not a clear cut one, and I I, I ran some numbers as we say uh, when I when I when you raised this question, Starkey, and uh, really Worth is they, they are about the same against left against right handed pitching offensively. They're they're about the same. Victorino hits for a little bit better average, and Worth has more power. Uh, Worth is the substantially better hitter against left handers. And, and um, so, so that that would argue that he maybe makes more sense as an everyday player, and Victorino could be platooned 
in uh, in right field, or or even let him play center field on the sure. days he plays. Exactly. Uh, with um, brain lock, they, uh, they, Jeff Jenkins. Yeah, thank you, yes. Jeff Jenkins. And and so, so maybe it's a tough call, and it's a clear cut call, and I would not be critical of Charlie either way. But I, I think it makes a little bit more sense to let to let Worth try and play every day for a while. He has the reputation of being a platoon player, but he's had physical problems. Maybe he hasn't had a full shot at it. Yeah, that, that's the thing. Uh, I'm not trying to get a Wally Pip situation going here, but I am looking at it as there's this old thing in sports where if you get injured, you're not supposed to lose your position. But I'll tell you what, Jason Worth last year, late August, early September, got to play every day because of injuries. Victorino was out then, too. And when he gets to be in there on an everyday basis, this guy comes through. Last year, late in the season, he batted 329 down the stretch, 428 on base percentage, and had 39 RBI. And seems to be a guy who likes the big moment. Yes. So is, isn't scared by the drama and, and, and the pressure. Uh, remember some of the games he played against the Mets in those key those key September games in the pennant race. Um, so, so yeah, I, I would have no. I would have again. I would not be critical of of Charlie if he just goes back to Victorino, which is what I expect him to do. But but I, I I would I would have no problem at all with giving Jason Worth a little shot at and letting him prove if he's an everyday player. Speaking of being critical of Charlie, I'm not critical in that situation, but I have been very critical of Charlie Manuel over his time with with the Phillies as manager. And I was down at the Phillies game, Mike, on Sunday. It was some friends, and we're driving back, and the Phillies had won the game against the Giants. And they announced that Charlie Manuel had won his 500th game as manager in baseball. That's with the Indians and the Phillies. He's in his seventh season with the team right now. And he has a 501 and a 428 record because he won last like, Monday night against the Diamondbacks as well. Here's my question. Is he really a good manager? Do X's and O's really matter in baseball if this guy's got 501 wins right now? This is one of the things about baseball that is that makes it so unique among sports. It's, it's so interesting because in baseball, a lot of times there, there's there's a decision to be made, leave the pitcher in or take him out, uh, bunt or swing away. They, you know, all of these kind of decisions that come up in a baseball game. And, and in many cases, there is an objective right answer. There's a there's a way that there there's a move that you can make that is that is better odds than the other one, but in many many cases it's like fifty two percent to forty eight kind yeah. of thing. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, it's 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 whereas in the other sports there's almost no such thing as objectively right, but but there's some that are that are more obvious than others. Um, so so I think a lot of times Charlie uh, get gets a bad rap for some of these uh, moves that he makes in terms of running a ball game. Um, and, and some of the moves that he makes that people are that people are not critical of, I am critical of. So, so you know, you could just go endlessly with that. But baseball managers who are successful find a way to create an atmosphere in which guys can perform. There's no there's no clear cut formula for it. Some guys do it by being tough. Some guys do it by being a buddy. Some guys the players hate him. Some guys the players love him. Billy Martin, the players the players hated him. But he was able to have as much short-term impact on a team as just about as just about any manager who ever lived. Um, Charlie obviously is a guy that the players really like, and uh, and that seems to that seems to work for this situation. And and he was successful in Cleveland too. Now he, he had teams that should have won in both cases. Very talented teams, both in Philadelphia and when he was with Cleveland. Yeah. you know. He's never had less than 85 wins. He averages 85 wins a season, Mm -hmm. and his teams have never finished worse than second. The year he got fired in Cleveland, they were in third place halfway through a year. But other than that, first or second every year for this guy. He's doing something right out there. I think he is. I mean, we've all seen managers screw up talented teams, so you can't just say, well, he's talented, he should have won. Am I right? That's correct. There you go. It's one of these things that's a great debate, and it's it's one of those conventional wisdom sometimes in baseball where you, you debate different things. And when we talk MVP in the NBA, our next topic here, folks, uh, the great debate is who should be the MVP. I think in NBA, and I also, Mike, we've talked a little bit in baseball, you can debate different issues. What's the MVP really about? Um, who should get it this year, the MVP? Well, first of all, Kobe Bryant is, a, is, is going to be, or, or already has been, I think it might have been, the press conference might have been today, uh, named the MVP of the league. I, I don't. I don't agree with that. I. I, I think LeBron James is the MVP, and uh, I, I think. I think he's probably going to finish third or fourth in, in in the voting. Let me make my. Let me make my case for LeBron. Um, if you take, I, I think going into the playoffs, there were probably seven or eight teams in the league that had a real chance to win the championship. 
I would say the three the three good teams in the East, Boston, Cleveland, Detroit, and the four teams that are still playing out West, and arguably maybe Phoenix. So let's say those eight teams. Okay. If you take those eight teams, each of those eight teams, and take away their best player, which of those remain? Which of those teams now are is, is the worst team? I think Cleveland is by far. It's not even. It's it's not even close. He carries his team more than any other. More than any individual in in the league carries his team. And the the thing that that Kobe does best is score. LeBron scores more and shoots less. Uh, I think he's got better playmaking. I think LeBron has better playmaking skills. I think LeBron has a better. Um, he's a better passer, ball handler, that kind of thing. Kobe clearly a better defensive player than LeBron. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and uh, so, so that I, I just think I think Kobe, I think LeBron James is the best player in the NBA, and I think he's the most valuable player. In the NBA. You know, McLaughlin wrong. No, <laughs> I you know I don't think there is a wrong answer here. Great debate. You know what? As a fan, I love watching them all. It made the NBA yeah. special and fun this year. We have we have four legitimate candidates this yes. year. Uh, the two we've mentioned, Chris Paul and Kevin Garnett of the Celtics, and they are phenomenal basketball players. People who think that the NBA is struggling and there's nobody you want to see in the NBA, those are people who aren't paying any attention to the NBA. These guys are phenomenal basketball players, and more than just in terms of raw physical talent. Starkey, go yeah. ahead. David Stern, stop stop doing expansion. Don't talk about taking teams to Europe. Keep it where it is. It's finally going to be really? a good product again. Really, Kobe, though, I got to watch him a lot this year. Uh, 28 points, 6 rebounds. Here's the key one for me. 5.4 assists. Really got other teammates involved. Lamar Odom's a great teammate for him. He's very, you know, they got Paul Gasol, Andrew Bynum was great this year. He did a better job this year of not being the ball hawk. Sure, he does shoot the ball a lot, but I, I really was proud of and fun to watch this year. And, and I've not been, been a big Kobe Bryant fan in years past, but really enjoyed watching the way he distributed. In his 12th season, he finally seems to be getting it. It's hard um, to believe he's been playing for 12 years. Your idea was to take away the best player, and, and then how good is that team afterwards? I'm saying you don't take him away. He's on the team. How did he make those guys better? The Lakers in, in the West, which was extremely tough this year, finished first. Chris Paul, yeah, he averaged 21 points, 4 rebounds, 11.6 assists. His team finished second in the West, and he clearly made them really well. And I guess if you took him off that, they would not be the same team. Sure. And Garnett, his team, the Celtics, went from the worst record in basketball last year to the best record. 19 points, 9.3 rebounds, 3.5 assists, and 1.2 blocks. He was phenomenal. So, you know, as I said, I'll go back to my point. I don't care who wins it because they're all good, and they made the NBA fun for me to watch this year. But I'll tell you what, Kobe Bryant really makes the Lakers, I think, the strongest contender to win the, the title this year because of what he's able to do. He scores 40 points against Denver one game, and the next game comes back, and before he tries to score, gets everybody involved and has six assists in the first quarter. Well, here's my, here's my, here's my only problem with, with the Kobe thing. Everybody, everybody is saying, and you're, you're saying, and I think you're right about this, he has been a better teammate this year than he's ever been before. That's essentially what you're saying. Yes. But if you give him LeBron's supporting cast, is he going to go back to being the Kobe of a year ago or two years ago? I, I think maybe he would. I think it's, it's, it's easier to be a good teammate when you've got Paul Gasol around you. We that's, con- my, that's my take on it. It's a good take. It's a good take. We will continue to debate it when the camera's off. But until <laughs> next week, <laughs> from the low post, I'm Eric Stark. He's Mike Gross, the award-winning sports writer. Yeah. Congratulations on that uh, award. <laughs> Thank you so much. For our producer, Paul Franz, we'll see you next week from the Low Post.